So welcome, I think we need to get started. I think we'll have people uh, coming in. It's hard with three sessions to get everybody started and finished and started on time. We're really looking forward to uh, these vignettes about uh, Paula Phelps Lyman, Priscilla Turley Lyman, Dionysia Walker Lyman, and uh, Eliza Levin Lyman. And I'd like to turn the time over to Ann. Ann uh, is a monster, I'm sorry, who will uh, be presenting on Paulina. And then we'll have uh, Sarah Barber who will be presenting on Priscilla. Is that right? Okay, thank you. And this right here is a picture of my mother's family. That guy on the far left is my grandpa, his name's Albert Leonard Nicholson, and his mother's right here, her name is Florence Lyman Nicholson, and that's how I'm related to Paulina Lyman, who I will be pretending to be for the time being. in my black bag. I also... It was a bigger bag than that. It had to have been, yes, but, you know, DI and all. Okay, um, I rushed around in my black dress, you know, delivering babies. People could see me at night, running to, you know, help some woman push on a watermelon. And, uh, Frank, obviously right now, I'm wearing my other dress. But, um, yeah, my parents got married. My parents, my father is named Morris Charles Phelps, and he was born in 1805 in Massachusetts. Um, my mother was Laura Clark Phelps, born in 1807 in Connecticut, and they were married on March 26, in 1827. They lived in Illinois for five years, where Marianne, my younger sister, and I were born. Um, my parents became interested in the LDS Church and were baptized in 1831, and then we were driven from Jackson County to Clay County. There, my father was called on a mission um, in 1834, which means he left, you know, the three of us kids, my mom, um, she taught school and practiced obstetrics um, to get us through that time to Missouri to help us get along. We moved to Far West because of persecution, where my father was attacked by a mob and put in prison. He stayed in jail until he escaped with Parley P. Pratt, um, the assistance of Orson Pratt and my mother. So, the story is a little fuzzy here. So, there may or may not have been a coffee pot that my mother gave to the jailer and was like, you need to give this to these folks. And then the plan was, in this version of events, that um, King Follett, who was one of the prisoners, he would throw open the door, and then my father, being a strong athlete, would grab the jailer and throw him to the ground, and then they would all escape. With the horses that my mother and her brother, John Clark, had, and Orson Pratt, had hidden in some bushes nearby. Um, so they, this succeeded for the most part. Well, okay, I can't say for the most part. My mother was left to a mob, which is kind of a problem. Um, a young man helped her get to some friends in Indiana, so she, you know, lived. So my father went on another mission in 1839. He took my mother and Joseph, who was then the youngest child of our family. On that mission, another son was born, Jacob Spencer Phelps, and then on that mission, my mother got sick and died. I was 15 years old at the time. So I was baptized on June 1st, 1835 by my father and I was blessed by Parley P. Pratt. As a child, I was melancholy and lonely and often sad, but I had a dream that if I read every day, that I would not only improve my mind, but I would also improve my spirits, and it worked. Um, as a youth, I was blessed by Joseph Smith that I would complete the trek to the Rocky Mountains. Um, I was taught to be a midwife and nurse by my mother, and I helped raise the rest of the children after she died. Um, at age 19, I married Amison Mason Lyman on January 16, 1846 in the Nauvoo Temple, along with Priscilla Turley. We both got married to him that day. Um, Oscar Morris Lyman, my first son, was born in winter quarters on the 16th of December, 1847. The diet in winter quarters camp was very meager. It was just cornbread, salt, bacon, and occasionally a little milk. Um, because of this insufficient diet, scurvy, or black life as we called it, 
and tuberculosis or consumption and malaria and other fevers plague the settlement. Um, an acquaintance of mine, Louisa Barnes Pratt, wrote in one of her memoirs, um, I hired a man to build me a sod cave. He took turf from the earth, laid it up, covered it with willow, brush, and sods, built a chimney of the same. I paid a $5 gold piece for building my sod house, 10 by 12. A long, cold rainstorm brought more severely again the chills and fever. These with scurvy made me helpless indeed. Many of my friends sickened and died in that place when I was not able to leave my room, could not go to their bedside to administer comfort to them in the last trying hours, not even to bid them farewell. Neither could I go to see their remains carried to their final resting place, where it was thought that I would shortly have to be conveyed. Most of the rest of us also lived in conditions like these. From mid-September 1846 to uh, May 1848, disease caused the death of 359 residents. I was part of the Willard Richards Company. I drove a team for Sidney Tanner, as attended his wife while she was sick, and then cared for her eight children after she died. This is my contribution to the Oberlin journals, and I actually have more, so just a second. Oh, it's a futuristic device I've never heard of. <laughs> Does this first? First? No, I'm just starting to have the Okay. So on Friday the 25th, I traveled 17 miles, or we traveled 17 miles, one wagon wheel broke down, camped on a low moment or something. Saturday the 26th, repairing wagons and one ox dead. Sunday the 27th, finished wagons, shoeing oxen, traveled five miles long to be remembered, uh, camped on branch of La Blonde. Uh, Monday the 28th, traveled 14 and a half miles, fourth wagon broke, or four wagons broke, camped on El Aopar River, um, birth Mrs. Elizabeth Brown, a son. Tuesday the 29th, traveled eight miles and a half, one ten left behind, camped on Fort Force, Voice River. No, I didn't pronounce that. Wednesday, the 13th, 30th, traveled 11 miles, camped on the flat, one mile and a half west of Deer Creek. Thursday, the 31st, repairing. September the 1st, repairing. Saturday the 2nd, repairing, killed a bear. Sunday the 3rd, a birth, Mrs. Thomas, a son. Traveled three miles, camped on flat. Monday the 4th, traveled 10 miles, camped on flat. Tuesday the 5th, meet some men from the valley, past the old ford, traveled seven miles, camped on flat. Wednesday the 6th, no traveling, meet the wagons from the Young Company going back. Thursday the 7th, traveled 16 miles, camped at Mineral Spring. Friday the 8th, traveled 16 miles, camped at Willow Spring. Saturday the 9th, traveled nine miles and three quarters, camped on Greasewood Creek. Sunday the 10th, traveled 10 miles and camped on Sweetwater. Monday the 11th, traveled six miles, camped to Devil's Gate. Tuesday the 12th, traveled two and three quarters, stopped on account of rain. Wednesday the 13th, traveled 12 miles, camped on Sweetwater. Mother Crosby sick. Thursday the 14th, traveled 10 miles, camped at Gravely Bluff on Sweetwater. Friday the 15th, traveled 10 miles, camped between two stone bluffs on Sweetwater. Saturday the 16th, no traveling, went a hunting. Sunday the 17th, traveled eight miles, camped on Sweetwater. Monday the 18th, traveled 16 and a half miles, camped on Sweetwater. Tuesday the 19th, traveled nine miles, camped on Sweetwater. Wednesday the 20th, traveled seven miles, camped on Sweetwater. Thursday the 21st, traveled 10 miles, camped on Branch of Sweetwater. Friday the 22nd, traveled seven miles, camped on Sweetwater. Saturday the 23rd, traveled <coughs> seven miles, camped on Pacific Creek. Sunday the 24th, traveled nine miles, camped on Dry Sandy. Monday the 25th, traveled 13 miles and three quarters, camped on Little Sandy. Tuesday the 26th, traveled eight miles and one fourth, camped on Big Sandy. Wednesday the 27th, traveled 17 miles, camped on Big Sandy. Thursday the 28th, traveled five miles, camped. Friday the 29th, traveled 10 miles, camped on Green River. And on Saturday the 30th, traveled 15 miles, camped Black, camped Black's four, and then the page was torn off. Black Fork, which is down there somewhere. Okay. I settled in Salt Lake City in October at age 21. I lived in Old Ford where everything was rationed. Some cotton was brought in and I obtained some. I made candle wicks to sell. I also made carpet, pants, and bed spreads, as well as nursing those around me. I stayed for nine years in Salt Lake City and I gave birth to three more boys. 
Mason Roswell was born on the 5th of July, 1851. Clark was born the 5th of October, 1853. Charles Rich, born the 18th of February, 1857. Clark died at only six months old. In the late 1850s, I moved to Little Salt Lake, as they call it, or Perwin. I stayed with Jesse N. Smith until I found a permanent place. I have William Horn, who was born the 19th of February, 1859, and I continued to weave, sew, tailor, and care for the sick. Um, I took in Cornelia Levitt Lyman, another of Amazon's wives, after she came back from the San Bernardino settlement. Cornelia was sick and died after two years, leaving her two sons for me to care for. I had another son and daughter, um, Salon Ezra, born the 9th of August, 1863, and then Laura Polina, born the 19th of August, 1865. I lived in a house across from Church Square, and then I later moved into a house my son built with a birthing room in it, it was perfect for me. I experienced yet another death of my son, of another son, Mason Roswell, who died at 14. George B. Warren and Edgar S. Clark rode into town saying Mason had accidentally been shot. It was during the Black Hawk War, and he had had his gun wrapped up in his bedding, and it went off, hitting the abdomen. Amsa took it real hard. It was his, you know, strong, tough, he was son. already six feet tall, 200 yeah, pounds. He was, a, he was a large fellow. Um, and I held towels to his bleeding wound before he died because people didn't really survive wounds like that. After he died, I vowed to learn more about medicine. And I was, I was on board very early with the use of carbolic acid as an antiseptic, which wasn't really an accepted method of helping people heal from wounds. Um, another son, Oscar Morris, died at the age of 27 on um, to the 22nd of October in 1874. He left behind his wife, Phoebe Medora Benson, and two sons, Oscar Morris Jr. and George Richard. And Oscar Morris Jr. is who I'm related to. Um, Oscar Morris Sr., my son, who of course I'm related to because I'm Polina. <laughs> I know this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He worked as an engineer at a sawmill in Red Creek Canyon. Um, the boiler had exploded and killed him and Frank Westbrook. Before this had happened, he had told a friend of his that he had a dream about the boiler exploding. And what did he know? It was about to happen. Oh, but that's, you know, still sad, yeah. But he warned the others to get away. Oh, that just as it was gonna happen. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, because I wasn't there when my son died, of course. And then Paulina saw him when he was, his body had got to die. Horrible. Yeah, sounds like it would be. I mean, of course it was, because I experienced it. All right, um, in 1886, at age 59 or 60, I studied obstetrics with Dr. Ellis Ship in Salt Lake City. She was born Ellis Reynolds. She came to Utah Territory in 1852. Her family was among the early Mormon settlers of Pleasant Grove, Utah in 1866. She married Milford Ship, and then they had 10 children, but only six survived infancy. She began studying at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1875, and she left her children in the Utah Territory with other wives, with the other, yeah. Um, Brigham Young sponsored her education. It's kind of interesting. He was very interested in making sure that women got some education. Um, thanks to her, her information and teaching, I later gave classes in Parowan. I taught Juliet C. Adams and Ellen Miller Davenport, and my daughter, Laura. Um, once a uh, squaw came to get help with one of the other Indian women who was violently ill. Um, when she came into the town, she before just taking the bath with her, she uh, went around to get food from all the neighbors. And then as soon as we got into town, I saw all those starving little Indian kids gathering around her to get that food. And after I took care of the woman and her and left her in good health, I vowed to never leave Never let turn, okay, never turn away another hungry Indian. Another time, a Paragona man took me to an Indian camp outside of the town to deliver a baby. Uh, the driver lost control of the horses, and we were dragged for quite some time before he regained control. Um, but after that, I still I felt it very important to maintain composure and go deliver this baby. So you know, got out of the carriage, shook off my skirts, and went to go deliver a baby. Um, there was a woman, her name was Mary Gay Evans, who I helped her deliver many of her babies, and one came just after her husband had died of pneumonia. After the children were finished admiring their beautiful little you know, sibling, um, 
their mom had given each of them a silver dollar to give to me. But God gave them that child. I didn't, so I couldn't take a cent of that money. On March 29, 1893, I was invited to the dedication of the Salt Lake City Temple even after my husband had died. I'm gonna see if I can read this because I think it's interesting. Son that's here today. Oh really? Oh really? From from New York, yeah. Oh, cool. Al Christians. Many bills to pay and no money to pay them. 
But fortunately, due to my father's prior business relationship with King George IV, the king offered them land in Canada to help them out of their sticky situation. So, in 1825, my parents gratefully accepted the offer and moved to Canada with their two children, Theodore Turley Jr. and Francis Amelia Turley. Two years later, Marianne was born, and two years after that, I was born in Toronto, Canada on June 1st of 1829. In 1836, when I was about seven years old, Elder Polly P. Pratt brought the gospel to Canada, and he converted Elders John Taylor and Isaac Russell to Mormonism. And after Elder Polly P. Pratt had left, those two continued preaching around Canada. However, they were having a difficult time finding somewhere for them to preach, so they asked Father if they could use his chapel. Father was a Methodist preacher, but he decided that it would be a good idea to listen to what the Mormons had to say. So not only did he give them permission to use his building, but he asked his congregation to come and listen to the Mormons with him. After singing, praying, and hearing their message, Father decided that the Mormons were the true church, and he said to himself, that is the truth, and I shall be condemned if I do not accept it. So he did, and shortly after, both mother and father were baptized on March 1st of 1837. And from that time forth, father dedicated his life and his service to the church. But also from that time forth, we had more struggles and hardships than that as a little girl I thought was possible for one family to have in an entire lifetime. Father sold our farm for $1,400 and with only two wagons and four horses, we traveled nearly 1,000 miles to, into the far west on July 18th of 1838. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Governor Box issued his infamous extermination order, saying, Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. The extermination order resulted in the Hans Mill Massacre, where 17 Mormons were killed and 15 were injured, along with four of the attackers. Perhaps it was just me, since I witnessed it all as a young Mormon girl, but I don't believe that killing someone because of their harmless beliefs is in any way necessary for the public peace. We were righteous and obedient in all of our doings, yet we were continually being kicked out of our homes and thrown out onto a new trail. A new trail that would lead to new trials, many of which were great trials to our faith, but never great enough to make us doubt our God's awareness of us. Many families, mine included, were shipped down the Missouri River and up the Mississippi River to Quincy, Illinois. The distance was nearly 200 miles, and the weather was very cold and excessively unencouraging. During the journey, my family slept in a single tent for 13 weeks, dreaming of the new place that we would call home. But once we arrived, it wasn't any better than our overcrowded tent. We arrived in the late spring, and there was no roof and no shelter of any kind, so we continued to sleep in our fabricated house under the sky while Father started to build our home. We were in a constant state of feeling helpless. We would all be soaked to the bone, it being too wet and too cold for the fire to stay lit, and we would all huddle closely under mother's cloak and wait for father to return for the night. And many times, we would wake up to the bed still being wet and cold from the night before. During this time, the prophet received revelation that the apostles needed to serve foreign missions, and although father wasn't an apostle, he was called to go along. Now, they were all very hesitant to leave behind their families, especially during such a desperate time when many of their family members were too ill to even move. Father and many of the apostles were also very ill, but they were promised that they and their families would be blessed and looked over if they did what they were asked. So they did. But they fortunately were given a few months before they would be required to leave, which gave Father the time that he needed to finish building our home and to make the arrangements that he was able to regarding our welfare. Then he and the other men left their families behind to go and serve the Lord. Father served in Birmingham, where he grew up, and he worked on converting his and my mother's family and friends to the church. While he was there, he was thrown into prison under the pretense of him not paying off his bills from all those years before because of his business partner, even though he had paid them off. 
but really they just wanted him in there so that he would stop preaching. But that didn't stop Father. He just preached in jail. And if Mother thought that his hands were rough when she chose him as a husband, just imagine how much harder they must have been after he withstood all of the trials he went through because he was a Mormon. And although we do have many struggles as Mormons, we have far more blessings. And one particularly special blessing that we received was the safe return of Father. We were all in raptures when he arrived at home, and he was fortunately able to open up his shop and start his work as a gunsmith, and then we were able to live happy and content for a few good years. During this stretch of time, one day on a particular afternoon, I was at home babysitting my baby brother, while the rest of my family went to go pick berries. The baby was napping when I heard a noise coming from outside, so I quickly moved to the door to look out to see who was coming, when I spotted a large black man running towards my home. I didn't look too closely, in fact I tried to not look at all, for he appeared to not be wearing any clothing, but it was nearly impossible to keep my eyes averted when he continued to run straight towards the still open doorway, and he proceeded to run straight into my home, up the ladder and into the attic. In my defense, even if I had tried to stop him, I'm nearly positive it would have been physically impossible. He was nearly twice my size. You would think that having a stranger in your home, a large stranger in your home, would cause you to be worried about yourself, or maybe your sleeping baby brother's safety, or even the safety of your home. But the only safety I was concerned about was the safety of the barrel of maple sugar that I happened to know was currently sitting next to a giant man that could take me out with a flick of his baby finger. So I said to myself, I won't let that black man get our sugar. And I took the ladder down, his only way of escape, and I dragged it around the house and I laid it on the ground. Then I hurried back to our home, and only a moment later I heard another noise coming from outside. But this time it was the sound of horse hooves hitting the ground. So I once again walked over to the door and opened it to see who the next visitor would be. Good news is, he was fully clothed. The bad news is, I didn't have a good feeling about him at all. He came up to the door and the second stranger of the day asked me if I was the only one at home. I answered with the half-truth, saying, well, I have my baby brother asleep in his crib. The man looked around hastily and then he did the strangest thing. He gave me a quarter of a dollar. I mean, I certainly wasn't complaining. But then he said, you're the first darn Mormon girl that could tell the truth, only he didn't say darn if you catch my meaning. As he hurriedly rode away, I didn't know whether or not to be offended at his assumption that all Mormon girls were dishonest, or to be pleased at having received payment for telling a lie. So I settled with both. The family returned shortly after, and upon telling Father the events of the day, he quickly brought the ladder over to the attic and let the man down. After Father got a closer look at him, it was discovered that he wasn't truly a black man, but a man covered in tar. It was also discovered that he wasn't a stranger at all, but my father's friend, Anne Salina. He stayed with us for a few days, and then he went home. It turned out that my lying had saved his life. And that wasn't the only time my lying kept someone out of some serious trouble. Shortly after, the mob was after the prophet, causing Joseph Smith to have to go into hiding, and the families would take turns bringing him his dinner. One evening, mother asked me to deliver it. So as I was walking along the path with the basket of food under my arm, a man stopped me and said, little girl, your parents know where the prophet is. Now you tell me. And even though I knew exactly where the prophet was, I looked up innocently and said, well, if they did know, they wouldn't tell a little girl like me. He let me pass. <laughs> you should keep in mind, however, that the moral of these stories is not that we should tell lies. I think it's more of that we should make sure that we always listen to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. He is there to protect us after all, which is especially why I should have listened to him on an afternoon that took place not long after the lying incident. My brother Isaac and I were watching the men drive saw logs down the river. And it looked awfully fun, and being the curious little children that we were, we thought it would be a good idea to make ourselves involved. So we convinced someone to let us get on the raft on our own, and the two of us headed down the river, very quickly and very dangerously. One of the men driving the saw logs saw us and quickly realized how much danger we were in. So we quickly told all of the other men that they needed to try and catch us before we got to the rapids. 
He started running down the bank, jumping over bushes, leaping over rocks, making the whole ordeal look incredibly majestic. Anyways, he managed to reach us in time, and he rescued us. Once we were on safe and solid ground, I was finally able to get a closer look at our hero, and I was astonished to find that it was none other than our dear friend, Amos Alignan. He later told the other men that I had been the girl who had saved his life, and that he couldn't stand to think of anything happening to me. However, this was towards the end of those happy and content years, for shortly after the prophet was martyred at Carthage jail, and the saints knew that the only way to find peace would be to move to the Rocky Mountains. It was also around this time that many men were living in polygamy. Amos Alignan was reluctant to do so, but when the authorities insisted, he grudgingly realized that that was what he needed to do. My father offered that he marry one of his daughters, suggesting one of my elder sisters, but Amasa told him that if he were to take any, that it would be me, for he wished to protect me always. So on January 16th of 1846, I, along with another one of his wives, was sealed to Amasa Lyman for time and all eternity. I was the youngest of his wives, however, so I continued to live at home with my parents for a time while I continued to go to school and to work for others. That is, until 1851, when 150 families, 500 people, were called to make a settlement in San Bernardino, California. We were all led by my husband, and it took us nearly three months to make the journey. But the people of California were very kind to me. Upon arriving at the San Bernardino Rancho, the lady of the household gave me two pies made of pine nuts. So to thank her, I later gave her some cloth and a few other things as a present. But the lady, not wishing to be outdone, then brought me two large silver candlesticks, hand engraved, that weighed eight pounds each. <clears throat> um, so I thanked her for that, and I treasured them for many years. But those weren't the only treasures I received that year. While living in San Bernardino, I had my first two children, Theodore and Ira. And I also became very good friends with Amos's other wives while living there all of which were very kind, strong women. It was around that time when Amos's wife Cornelia passed away, and a few of his wives, along with myself, helped to raise her two sons, Henry and Lorenzo. Many of us, I was, oh, sorry, I was called to be a midwife by the prophet and um, to help care for the mothers and the babies. So in total, well not total, but I helped bring over a hundred lives into this world. And a few years later, many of us were called to move to Utah, and while living there, I had my next four children. Only two of them were Ida's children. When my two oldest were married, we moved to Idaho, and the slime in town came in through the distance. And my oldest wife also passed away, leaving her three sons, the ages of two, four, and six, Frank, Elmer, and Guy, to be cared for, which I did for many years until the oldest was married. My baby girl, the only girl of the family, she married young and she came and she lived near me in Idaho until 1886 when we all moved back to California and lived very close to San Bernardino once again. There my daughter died, leaving her three beautiful little girls, Florence, Edna and Maud, to be cared for. My son Theodore told me that I was not to raise them as I had done my share of such work, but I wanted to help, so I did. I just didn't raise them as completely as I had the other children. In total, I raised about 15 children, only six of them being my own. And aside from raising the children, I loved making quilts and rugs, which were called beautiful by many, and I made sure to make one for each of my children. When I was about 70 years old, I was at my son-in-law's house for a party. I loved dancing, and my old creaky bones didn't make me want to dance any less. Unfortunately, I fell, and I injured my hip, causing me to have to live on crutches for the last few years of my life. And those last few years ended on September 12th of 1904 in Redlands, California. I hope that now it's easier for you to see that I am not just a picture or a name from your genealogy, that I'm a Mormon, a pioneer, a midwife, a fighter, a believer, and much, much more. And so are the rest of names and pictures from your genealogy. And you are too. We often are more than we think we are, and it's usually easier for us to see that after we've finished what we came here to do, which is why it's important that we understand that what we're here to do isn't easy. But if we want to have all of the blessings that God has in store for us, 
it's very important that we do not settle for the soft and smooth in life, but for the hard and callous, because although it is harder, it's worth it. She wouldn't let me put on my dress. <laughs> Great job, ladies. I think I'm the impossible substitute for the two wives that didn't have any descendants that lived. What? Cornelia. She, but they died. Oh. She had two sons, yeah, but no daughters. Um, Dionysia was married when she was 14 to Micah Whitney. And they had four children. The husband and all four children died in an epidemic. And Later in Nauvoo, there was obviously a relationship with Joseph Smith that Lyman Platt talked about a little bit yesterday. And he knows more genealogy than I do by far. But I know that at some point, Emissa had a relationship with Dionysia. They never had any children, but they were together a lot. When Amasa became an apostate, she was a, probably again sealed to Joseph. But I don't deny what Lyman says about their being sealed earlier. Dionysia had a sister who had children, and she died on the trek west. Dionysia took care of those until her husband, who was in the Mormon battalion, came back. The, the dead sister's husband came back. Eventually, Dionysia located in the new town of Minersville, which Emissa had helped found. And among the other settlers were Bishop I believe his name is James Henry Rollins. Anybody know for sure? He was the bishop a long time in Minersville, and his sister, Mary Leitner, who was sealed to Joseph Smith for eternity. Her husband never quit smoking and never joined the church and didn't believe in an eternal marriage after death. So Joseph was never married to her for time, but was married to her for eternity. So Henry Rollins is there, and Mary Leitner is there, and Dionysia is a sister of Rollins's wife, and has her own home in Minersville. And Amasa visits her a lot. But when Amasa apparently seemed to lose his testimony and his temple blessings, which were later restored, and I'll talk about that this afternoon. She was sealed to Joseph. Again, she probably had been earlier. I don't understand that. I don't know if Lyman will ever understand it all either, but I honor him for what he said yesterday. I loved it. We don't know very much about Denisha. I, all of my life, I never saw a photograph of her. My book has one. I finally found one. I don't know if anybody else has got more or knows any more about her. I know that after Amasa died, his son took some care of her. Maybe you remember if you heard, I know some of you did, Lyman say yesterday that her mother was sealed to Brigham Young. And he probably never slept with her, but did send clothing and food and shoes and other things to Nancy Walker, who lived with Dionysia in Minersville, her older mother. 
when Amasa died, his son, who became an apostle and was an apostle for 20 years, Francis Marion Lyman, continued to take care of Denisius at some times. He, I know that he paid for a set of false teeth for her. And, uh, and when she was out of food and the ward couldn't take care of it, uh, Francis M. made sure that she had it. Now that's not very much about a lady that was determined and faithful her whole life after she embraced Mormonism. I know that there was a time in Nauvoo when she threw hot water at a mob person outside the window and chased him off with some scalding. So she had some spirit, but we don't know very much about her. Somebody should take her on as a project because if you read between the lines in all of that Nauvoo material and Southern Utah, Utah material, there could be a biography of her. I wrote a piece about Aunt Pliny that was published at Southern Utah State University in a magazine they only had for two or three years. I was, Brenda and I were there at the dedication of the monument that's by the cemetery to her that Lyman and Lori apparently shook hands with yesterday at the monument, did you? Lyman said he shook hands, you, he wasn't with, you weren't with him then, you were with him today. He stopped at the monument and shook her hand, he said. Oh, yes, 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 we did. We shook her hand, we shook the, um, for the frat. Yeah. Anyway, Dionysia deserves, she's never really been mentioned in the 50 years I've been coming to these reunions. And we've never had her picture until somebody in the Rollins family in the Minersville area finally gave me one to put in that book so that we had a picture of each each wife that stayed with Amasa and was alive. I don't think Lyman had a picture of Dionysia in his book. I don't, yeah. The other lady I'm supposed to talk about, and I wish I knew a whole lot more about her, is, is Cornelia Levin, niece of Eliza or Snow and Lorenzo Snow a very faithful young woman in Nauvoo who apparently came west with Lorenzo after being sealed to Amasa. What happened, as near as I can guess, is that as Nauvoo's being dismantled in 1845 and 46, the Mormons have promised they'll leave. There are some teenage girls with really no family attachments. Now, certainly Priscilla Turley has attachments, and Paulina has some, and even Cornelia has some among uncle and aunt. But they are sealed to a worthy man whom they believe, and it's one of the main teachings of the church at the time, that maybe the guys that are your age that are going to school with you and trying to court you, won't get you to the celestial kingdom as likely as a proven, slightly older man. And I believe that these girls would have initiated most of the courtships with Amasa, knowing what I know about him. He didn't go out of his way to court too many other wives, but we don't know that. Anyway, I wish we had some some vignettes about like these two ladies did. They were wonderful, but we don't have on these other two. Cornelia <clears throat> lived in Perwin, taught school a year while Amos was on his mission, but her health wasn't good. That was too much for her. She already had the little boys, Henry Elias and Lorenzo Snow Lyman. And although Brigham assigned Emerson to gather all of his families to Fillmore, Denisha didn't go for good reasons. And she had more family ties down there. And Amos visited her quite often. Denisha didn't have those family ties, except 
She got a lot of letters from Eliza. She got poems from Eliza. She got, she sent letters complaining a little bit. She was sorry that Amasa hadn't yet built her a house. Whether in Fillmore or, or Perwin doesn't say for sure, but I do know that after his mission, he was particularly concerned with her feelings. She was the one that missed a husband the most from the letters I've seen, and I haven't seen a lot. But he took her on one of his preaching journeys through all of Southern Utah. And that was a, quite a privilege for, for any young woman. Uh, Polina would have taken care of the boys as she did after Cornelia died. It was about a four year illness. And some of the neatest letters I've ever seen of Emesis were letters to Polina, gratitude for the care she was giving Cornelia. He wasn't healthy in Salt Lake. It was winter, he could not get down to be by Cornelia's side. And neither could Eliza. In fact, she said in one letter, if I, or if I were an angel, I'd be there. Always poetic and uh, comforting to Cornelia, but in this particular illness, which she recovered from for a little while, Amasa took her north, including to Fillmore. And she saw the unfinished houses that the, those five wives that are up there were living in. And she decided she didn't have it so bad. She didn't complain anymore after that. And didn't campaign to move to Fillmore. In her last illness, Pliny was heroic. And again, Amasa couldn't get there in the snow and he is so grateful for the, for the compassion that this sister wife has all of the time. It's, it's unbelievable how good those women were, how strong they were, even in, in, health, in ill health. Henry Elias and Lorenzo Snow are teenagers when their mom dies. And they spent some time with Priscilla, Turley Lyman. But most of the time was with Polina Phelps, Phelps Lyman. And Amasa visited there a lot. I probably shouldn't say this, I said it last night, that she was his spiritualist medium dozens of times. She stayed in the church, her kids remained faithful, do you know if Laura married a Clark? Well, Laura, her mother, Alani's mother. Or her no, mother. I'm talking about the parents.